Welcome everyone to this creative process discussion, a search for musical language. And to begin with, I'd like to say what an honor it is to have this conversation across so many miles. It's a rare opportunity made possible by our digital circumstances. And I'm so grateful to share this time with all of you. Uh, we are here to, um, to introduce a concert by Quarteto Latino Americano. And I'm here with Sol Bitran, who is first violinist of the award-winning Quarteto Latino Americano. He was born in Mexico City to Chilean parents. And he is a recipient of the highest artistic awards given by Mexico and Chile, namely the Belas Artes Medal and the Order of Merit Pablo Neruda, and is a professor of violin at the Boston Conservatory. We are also joined by Latin Grammy nominated composer Gabriela Ortiz is one of the foremost, she's one of the foremost composers in Mexico today and one of the most vibrant musicians on the international scene. Her musical language achieves a synthesis of tradition and the avant-garde by combining high art, folk music and jazz in novel and personal ways. And we are also joined by Tony Geist who is a former chair of the UW School of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, or the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, and professor of Spanish and Comparative Literature. He's a translator, and he's led several mini center patron tours to Spain. And he has also been knighted by the Spanish government, and he has the Order of Isabella, the Catholic Queen. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining me for this conversation. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to share with our audiences, with all of you in the audience, a bit of history about Quarteto Latino Americano. So would you tell us how the quartet began and what your shared vision was with regard to repertoire, audience, and collaborations? Sure. So as some of you may know, or maybe some don't, uh, we in the quartet are three brothers, the Trump brothers, and we grew up playing chamber music at home with my parents. And we always had the dream of making chamber music, music the centerpiece of our musical career. So when we became professional or we were on our way to becoming professional, we decided to try forming a string quartet in Mexico City in the early 80s with our wonderful colleague, violist Javier Montiel, who we met studying at the conservatory in Mexico. Uh, we started rehearsing, um, we thought we had some potential, we started playing the regular repertoire for quartet, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, with which you, without which you really cannot make a quartet uh, progress. And pretty soon we started playing concerts in Mexico, and uh, mm -hmm. at some point we, we became curious about what was written for quartet in Latin America, and to our uh, enormous surprise we realize there is a lot of music which really very few people know music that hadn't been played written in the 40s 50s 60s by the greatest composers of latin america and these quartets were just languishing in in libraries and uh, gathering dust and uh, we started reading through uh, silvestre revueltas alberto ginastera Eitor villalobos we discovered we discovered a trove of fantastic music and when our first international tours came up, we decided that this is what we have to show because uh, there are plenty of quartets playing Mozart and Haydn in Europe and in the US, and there is no one playing this wonderful music. Mm -hmm. So even though we did not start the quartet with that mission in mind, it pretty soon became evident that if we want to compete in the international arena, and also if we want to showcase what we believe is fantastic music, which should be better known, what better idea would be that play our own Latin American repertoire? Absolutely, that's fabulous. And for many years, the quartet has been devoted to the important work of promoting Latin American music. Um, and, and this term really can't do justice to the incredibly rich, broad and diverse musical languages and perspectives it encapsulates. Uh, Gabriela, as a composer and educator, would you, could you speak to the idea of a search for language within Latin American music and how it has evolved from your perspective? Well, I, I guess I have to answer from my own um, experience. Uh, yes. You know, I belong to a family that, uh, that played folk music. Uh, my parents found a group, a very important group in the 60s that was called Los Folkloristas. 
So basically my first contact with music was with folklore music and not only the folklore of, of, of Mexico, but the folklore of Latin America. And I think that that was a very important uh, uh, point of departure uh, because I start playing the, the guitar and I start playing the charango, which is a very small guitar uh, that it's played in, in, in Peru and in Chile and in, in the north of Argentina. So I, I was totally involved here in this kind of music and, uh, and make and hearing all these, you know, my panels rehearsals uh, all the time in my house. But on the other side, also, my mother used to play piano. I mean, she played piano for 18 years, and she was a very good music reader. And uh, so I have this other side, the, the classical music side. Also, my father, he was just a lover of, uh, I mean, he always, uh, he, he always uh, loved classical music. He, he always, you know, when I was little girl i mean i was here in beethoven every morning i met my, my father i remember that he grew up and as soon as i know i start the day you know here in beethoven or Mahler, and mm -hmm. and then my father became a, a commentator of the national symphony orchestra in mexico mm -hmm. in the radio so he, he he was a very cultivated man and actually you know as i can tell you that my father went to all latin american string quartet concerts i mean he was really really fan of them so because he loved music and so i was very fortunate to to grow up with this uh, you know with my parents around so music was was there all the time i i always i always think that uh, that I didn't choose to be a musician. The music chose me. Mm -hmm. and, and so in a very natural way, I think that all these rhythms and all this folklore and all this wonderful culture was already in my DNA. I mean, it's part of me and, 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 and basically uh, it's, it's just there in a, in a, you know, as I said, in a very natural way. And then I studied piano. I started, when I was eight years old, I started studying piano and then uh, I started reading music and learned how to read music. And then in the, in, during, during high school, I, I, I learned harmony and solfege and all you know, the, you know, the, the, the tools that you need to be a musician. And then I realized that I wanted to be a composer more than a pianist. I started mm -hmm. writing little piano pieces and then I became a composer, but I wanted to become a composer. And I, so I started composition. So I think that these two, basically two backgrounds, the, the one that is, you know, the, the folk uh, music and the, and the Latin American culture, but also my Western European training is always there. And, 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 and I think that this mix of two worlds are in my music. And, and, and you can realize immediately in a very natural way that, that the, those things are there. Um, but if you think in Stravinsky or Bardo, those worlds are there too. I mean, the Russian you know, background of Stravinsky is there or, or the Hungarian background of Bardo, you can immediately realize that it's just there in a, in a very original way. So I guess that in that sense, uh, I, I can identify my music with those composers because immediately they have an identity, a cultural identity that, that is just there. And, and you can immediately hear it. Very organic. And we'll have an opportunity to hear, hear this, this mixture in, in, in La Calaca, which is part of the, the performance that has been recorded. Uh, that's part of this, this presentation. And, and, and Tony, as, as we reflect upon this idea of a search for musical language, would, would you speak to how in general social and political movements have influenced Latin American artists historically? Sure. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to understand that when we say Latin America, this is a vast region. It's, it's two continents, 21 countries, two major languages and numerous indigenous languages, which all coexist and contribute to what we call Latin American culture. Um, but I would, I would uh, point out three major uh, moments in the evolution of, uh, of Latin America, uh, what we call today Latin America. First is the independence movement from Spain, which took place between 1810 and 1820, and gave rise to uh, nationalist movements and, and the definitions, the forging of nationalist, uh, national identities. So, um, 
well, they're all Latin America. Um, Mexico is very different from, from Nicaragua, from Cuba, from Venezuela, from Argentina, from Uruguay. They all have their, their national traditions. Um, and the, but the independence movement, uh, the early 19th century gave rise to great many different cultural expressions, uh, both musically and uh, in literature and the visual arts. Uh, I would say a second moment, um, and I'm just picking what I see as key moments, there are many others that could be brought up, would be the Mexican Revolution, 100 years later, 1910. And a major expression that it gave rise to was uh, a few years later, the, the Mexican muralists in the visual arts, um, Diego Rivera, Orozco, and so forth. A few years later, um, Frida Kahlo gives expression to Mexican nationalism, Mexican identity. Um, Juan Rufo writes Pedro Paramo, which is an extraordinary novel about um, El Mexico Profundo, the, the, um, deep Mexico, right? And then I would say there's a third moment um, in the Cuban Revolution in 1959, which also um, is an ex both an extreme nationalist movement on the one hand and an internationalist movement on the other. And I would say one of the most important um, phenom cultural phenomena that, that, that the Cuban Revolution gives rise to is the, um, the Nueva Trova Cubana, this new uh, singer-songwriter movement um, built around uh, both traditional themes of love and so forth, but also around uh, deep social concerns um, and singing the revolution. So I would say that those are, are some of the things that um, we could talk about. Thank you. There's so many, so many places to delve even further into that. Um, uh, but I think what we'll do now is move on and talk about the, the works that we're going to be seeing in this performance. So Quarteto Latino Americano has provided us with a beautiful performance video that highlights the work of three composers. Um, our esteemed guest, Gabriela Ortiz, Hector Villalobos, and Alberto Ginastera. And so what I'd love to do is take our audience through these composers and pieces chronologically and tie them to the cultural and historical influences of their time. And so would you start off, uh, start us off with a bit about Villalobos and his quartet number no. five that you'll be performing in this, uh, in this uh, video? Sure, uh, Villalobos was an incredibly prolific composer. He wrote literally perhaps thousands of works. Um, among them, the astonishing number of 17 string quartets, which very few composers have achieved other than Haydn. Uh, in the 20th century, Shostakovich wrote 15, Beethoven wrote 17 plus the Gross, fu fu Grosse Fuga. There are really very few composers who wrote as many quartets, and Mozart also did. But the, uh, through, through Villalobos' over for the string quartet, we can see his evolution as an artist, as a composer, and also as a human being. His very first quartet from 1917 is a very naive, collection of uh, Brazilian tunes are beautifully arranged for quartet. Then he became interested in number two, number three in the uh, European Impressionism, where he got influences from, from BBC and lots of harmonics and colorings. But then in the 40s and 50s, coinciding with the nationalist movement in Latin America, he pretty much decided that his music has to sound Brazilian uh, and uh, taking these techniques that he had learned in his sojourn in Paris, he wrote Quartet Number no. Five, which is the one that we're going to be hearing today, and Number no. Six, which shares many common features with Number no. Five. Those two quartets, he actually liked to call them Quartetos Populares Brasileiros, Brazilian Popular Quartets, mm -hmm. because they are really inspired by Brazilian music. Number no. Five specifically, he uses a collection of very well-known children's songs that every Brazilian kid knows today by memory. And um, that he composes this piece that in which those songs appear in a very sophisticated way of uh, writing for string quartet. Very difficult, very colorful, full of special effects um, with a very rich cello part because he was a magnificent cellist. So you can hear these songs, but you mainly can hear 
in this quartet number five a lot of fireworks and very fast passage works and ex strange sonorities so it's a modernist piece at the same time it's very accessible because the content is popular later on Villalobos would f uh, get very far from this aesthetic and become, uh, become much more ascetic much more abstract neoclassical uh, a, la, a la Stravinsky in his later quartets especially the late ones 15, 16, 17, which are architecturally very clear, but the language is more uh, refined and less directly related to Brazilian folklore. So I think quartet number five is interesting because it's, it really stands in the middle, middle of his life and of mm -hmm. production and of his quartet cycle. And it probably combines the elements of his early Brazilian style with this much more sophisticated international modernist style that he would adopt fully later on. Thank you. That's 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 wonderful and and uh, and and so helpful as we as we listen to this work. Um, and Tony, I know you're particularly interested in Alberto Alberto Ginastera, who was born almost forty years after Villalobos. And I wonder if you could say a few few words about about his work and what we're going to be hearing. Sure. Um, Ginastera and I, he, he, toward the end of his life, preferred the um, Italian um, uh, or Catalan pronunciation of his last name, Ginastera. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Ginastera. No, that's, I mean, it is Ginastera in Spanish. He was born in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, uh, to a, a Catalan father and an Italian mother. So um, that in itself already says something about his identity, his Latin American identity, and specifically his Argentinian identity. Um, he spent a good deal of his life outside Argentina. Um, the end of his life, the last uh, 20 years or so of his life was spent first in the US and then in Switzerland where he died in, in 1983. And I find him quite fascinating for a number of reasons. He himself categorized his work toward the end of his life in three different periods. What he, the first period he called objective nationalism, uh, in which he incorporates, directly incorporates lots of uh, traditional Argentinian popular music themes. Um, the second, he uh, categorized the, his second period as subjective nationalism, in which he moves toward a more, uh, he still incorporates uh, traditional Argentinian music, but um, to, in a more abstract form. Uh, and I think uh, the key word here is nationalism, right? Objective and subjective nationalism. That is, he's still trying to write, he's, in, he's writing a music which he understands as an expression of a national identity or a national spirit. And then his third period, um, which sounds rather like um, Villa Lobos also, he called uh, neo-expressionism. And uh, again, it, it moves towards much greater abstraction. But even in that period, and the, the last major work, one of his last major works, the Popol Vuh, which he left, uh, wrote for about the last 10 years of his life and left unfinished, but has been performed. Um, the Popol Vuh is the book, the uh, pre-Hispanic book of Mayan, the Mayan myth of origin. And so he's constantly exploring um, what he understands as Latin American identity in, in his works, even at the very end of his life. So quite a fascinating figure, actually. Thank you, Tony. And, and so what, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I know you're very close to, to his work. Yes, and what's fascinating about Hinastera is that he also uh, wrote quartets that belongs to each of one of these periods. So we can really see his evolution. His first quartet belongs squarely into the objective nationalism period. And you can really hear the rhythms, the malambo rhythms, the gaucho rhythms, the Northwestern Argentinian, Andean folklore, the, the presence of the guitar. On the second quartet, he moves away from that. He still retains some of the rhythmic profiles of Argentinian music, but he's very careful not to sound folkloristic. You know, in, in fact, he revises his quartet that he wrote in 58, 10 years later, just to take away three passages that to him sounded too much like folkloric music. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the version of quartet number two that we recorded, which is a cleaner version. He was always fighting his, uh, the, the way people perceived him. He wanted to be perceived as Argentinian, but he was very careful not to be perceived as a composer with folkloric influences. So much so that when he moves uh, farther from that abstract expressionism, you would be hard pressed to find any connection to Argentinian music at all. His music becomes very close to Schoenberg's music. In fact, his third quartet, which belongs to this period, has a soprano, and it's a mirror image of Schoenberg's second string quartet, but with Ginastera's own very expressive, expressionistic, but different language than Schoenberg. So it's fascinating to see his inner struggles as a composer. He was, as I said, he was so preoccupied with this image that at some point in his life, he destroyed literally many pieces that he had uh, written as a young composer, fantastic pieces. Some of them, to our luck, were found in his archives. He didn't want them to be played, but people do play them sometimes. And one of them is a beautiful piece for flute and quartet called Impresiones de la Puna. It's a really, really beautiful, sweet, uh, melodic piece of which he was ashamed at some point. Wow. Um, it's so interesting when I when I listen to the entire Alta de Muertos, which is Gabriela Ortiz's work that we'll hear a, a piece from, somehow Schoenberg popped into my head in a moment, in a brief, brief moment, and I and it and then it went away fleetingly. But um, but there but there were so much in that work. And so Gabriela, I I wondered if if uh, again La, La Calaca is is one movement from your large work for string quartet entitled Altar de Muertos, which was commissioned by Kronos. And I wonder if you could share a bit about the history, inspiration, and composition of, of Altar de Muertos and La Calaca specifically, how you approached writing about the subject and thought about the structure and anything you'd like to share. Yeah, well, this piece was commissioned by Kronos, as you, as you just mentioned. And when David Harrington, he's the first violin player of the, of the quartet, he, he came to Mexico and he was totally obsessed with the concept of death because he, he lost his son. His son was 14 years old and it was a, a very, very sad uh, tragedy for him. And since that happened, he was really uh, doing a big, big search about how different cultures in the world approach the concept of death. And of course, Mexico is one of these countries that have the day of the dead, you know, the, the famous day. And he wanted me to, to write a piece about that. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, it was difficult for me because I didn't have that idea in my mind. But, but suddenly I started doing a, a big research and start reading a lot of books. And then I, I decided that, uh, that I, I wanted to do a search between the real and the magic and the exploration about what is the concept of death in Mexico through its own story, uh, history. So I divided this piece, it's, it's, it's a 35 minutes piece in four movements. The first movement is called Ofrenda, Offering. And for me, the idea of the Ofrenda is, is, is the entrance of four spirits to the altar. And those four spirits are represented by each member of the quartet. So one of the one of the members of the quartet start enter, enter into the stage and start playing a solo melody that for me is the offering. The music becomes the offering itself, and the others play a water drum. And why water drum? It's a, you know it's a pre-Hispanic instrument in the north of Mexico. They play the water drum, which is a it's a gourd that you play it on the on the contained with water, and and you play it. The sound, it's it's. At least to me, it reminds me to a heartbeat. And it was very strange because at that time I was pregnant. So I was thinking about death, but at the, at the same time I was giving birth. No, I, and yeah. I was totally obsessed with that. And, and immediately I thought that if I could bring this sound into this first movement, I was you know, bringing life and death mm -hmm. at the same time and, and as a metaphor. So the, the uh, so when you know the players are playing their own solos, the others, the rest of the of the quartet, play a very simple rhythm that imitates somehow the the idea of a heartbeat. Then the second movement is called Miklan, 
And it's about that, exactly that, because for the Prehispanic cultures, the concept of death is not a static concept. It's a concept, it's a cycle. And, and, and it's exactly that from, from birth becomes death and from death becomes birth. So um, what I wanted to do is, is to, to recreate a very obsessive music, very rhythmic, very complex, but, uh, but very obsessive. I don't know if you've heard the music of the Concheros. This, you know, that mm. music that that play in the Zócalo in in, mm -hmm. in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So whether these players attach a friar bones in their ankles and they start dancing, and the music is very obsessive with the drum, with the noise, the big uh, drum, and, and and the music is ton ton ton. It's oh, with a very obsessive pulse. And I wanted to recreate that, of course, in a very different way. And, and I mean, I'm not emulating anything like the Concheros dance music, but it's. But what I wanted to incorporate is the sound of these friar bones. So it's a very difficult piece because each of the members of the quartet have to attach these friar bones in their feet, and they have to step every time they see an accent in the score. So <laughs> it's 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 complex, but uh, but I think it's. I, I wanted to introduce that. Uh, as, 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 as the color of something very obsessive and, and, and obviously within this idea. The third movement is called Danza Macabra and of course is when you know the European culture came into, into this continent and, and for them, for the, this European culture, the, 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 is, uh, the concept of that is static and, and you have an alternative or, or you go to hell or you go to the glory to heaven. So it's an static concept. So I, I, I what I did is, is probably, I, I should say that this is the most uh, expressionist uh, movement of the, of the whole uh, string uh, quartet, because what I wanted to do, it's, 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 it's full of contract point, and, and, uh, and I wanted to recreate this phantasmagoric kind of atmosphere between all these imitation, between all these, you know, players playing all these, you know, um, melodies and using a lot of sul ponticello, color sound which for me because it did this uh, the distortion of the of the of the timbre uh, for me was the the idea of something more phantasmagoric or for something more enigmatic and so this is the idea of danza macabra and the laka laka which is the one that you're gonna hear which is what happens nowadays in mexico and 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 the pluralism the the the, the chaotic thing and and this multiple richness of symbols between the sacred and the profane and the good and, and bad and the day and, and night and the happiness and the sadness and everything happens at the same time. And so the music, what I wanted to recreate, it, 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 it was a very music with a lot of vitality and strength, very virtuosic again, but also the music has very different sections in which are, uh, you have a very high contrast between them. And this is what I wanted to recreate in, in La Calaca. And it's one of the unique pieces that I have a quotation from a melody from a which all uh, music that I, I was hearing at that moment, uh, uh, the music from the Huicholes from Nayarit. And I found a beautiful melody and I did a kind of an arrangement and, and and, and you hear 35 of my, uh, minutes of my music and suddenly the last three minutes of the, at the very end of La Calaca, I have this quotation. Of course, it, I developed the quotation in a, in a very rhythmic, complex way. And harmonically, uh, it's also very different because I have to harmonize this, me this melody. But, but there, yeah, I, I decided to use this quotation of this which whole melody uh, at the very end. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Is there anything else about your musical aesthetic, aesthetic and the influences that have informed your language that you'd like to share? I know you spent quite a bit of time also talking about that at the beginning. Um, this is a, a wonderful background to, to hearing this work. Well, I, I just want to add that, you know, uh, it's more the, the, the concept that I wanted really to, to achieve in this piece more than trying to get inspiration from specific music because there, 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 there is no, I mean, we don't know how the music from the Prehispanic cultures were. I mean, we have the instruments, but we don't know 
<laughs> no, no, we don't know anything more than that. So basically, it's my my own imagination about what 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 is more the inspiration and the concept and the symbol is. It's I think it's more abstract in that sense, more than trying to do something like you know more like in the nationalistic period that is more direct or more you no. Know, for example, uh, if you think about uh, Guapango by Moncayo, they are, the rhythms are very, very direct. I mean, you can immediately recognize that those rhythms are in folk music, in the Mexican folk music, or, or when, you know, Saul was saying that the, this first, uh, uh, this first, uh, um, side of Ginastera's music that, that you really can hear a malambo and you hear those rhythms in a very direct way. Here in Altar de Muertos is a totally different experience. It's the concept of the Day of the Dead and the culture that is just there, the inspiration is there, but I'm not emulating anything, it's just my own imagination. And in that sense, it's more abstract or more expressionist, or, or maybe you were right in, in saying that perhaps uh, I may see even there, you know, and perhaps in the third movement, I, I guess, I don't know, it's very difficult for me to also say what, <laughs> no, how, how, you know, how my music should be like, but, but, uh, but I want to tell you that the inspiration is more abstract. And, in, and it's more about you know what I, what I was trying to shape in in in, in terms of conceptual in, in more conceptual terms. That's so powerful. Thank you. And 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 I I you know know that Quarteto Latino Americano and you Gabriela have had a long history of collaboration. Um, Saul and Gabriela, could you please tell us a story of your working relationship over many years because you've you've known each other for quite a long time. Yes, we met Gabriela many, many years ago when she was a student of composition. The quartet had just started. I'm talking about the 80s. And um, I think we premiered your first string yes. quartet, didn't we? Yes. Yes. And your first string <laughs> quartet, we saw immediately a lot of talent, uh, a language that was bursting with expression, with uh, imagination, with experimentation. We saw, I mean, not only we saw potential, it was already a very good piece, but we were sure that Gabriela was going to go very far and indeed she went and, and we have remained in touch. We have played a lot of her music uh, in the late, uh, early 2000s. We recorded this beautiful album, uh, Altar de Muertos, which contains the whole piece, plus a piece that she wrote for soprano and quartet called Balca, the texts are in the Mayan language, and also a piece dedicated to Violeta Parra, the Chilean uh, author, author, songwriter, for piano and quartet. And we always uh, carry her music around the world. Altar de Muertos is a very difficult piece to tour with because you have to take the gourds and to ha you have to have uh, buckets with water in the stage and most presenters do, don't want to see water in their beautiful stages so we lately we just played it like a laca because it's and the other movements uh, danza macabra which i personally love is really difficult so like a laca is also devilishly difficult but we played often enough that we can say that we own it a little bit and i just feel that this music speaks to me like very few other Music. So I, I am a big fan of Gabriela's music. Thank you. And I don't know, Gabriela, if you'd like to say anything about this collaboration with the quartet. No, well, yeah, I'm very grateful with Quarteto Latino Americano. Absolutely. Yeah, indeed. They performed my first string quartet. I won a contest. Uh, this is in, in 86 or 87. And, and I, I won the first uh, place in that contest. On, and part of the of the of the of the of the of the grant was to hear my my piece play by the Cuarteto Latino Americano and so I was very very excited it was really one of my first chances that I heard my piece play, play professionally so for me it was really really important at the time and then um, years later when I wrote the uh, Altar de Muertos and then I wrote uh, Balca and then uh, 
I wrote specifically, specifically for the Cuarteto Latinoamericano, six pieces a Violeta, six pieces to Violeta. It's a homage to Violeta Parra for piano and a string quartet. And I'm very grateful because also my first solo CD is with them. I, I proposed them to, to do a solo CD. And, and so we, 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 we did it. And, and I'm very grateful with them because for me it was a very important uh, part of my, of my career to have my first you know, solo CD with my, my music and all my string quartets uh, recorded there. And all of them are very difficult. So I'm very grateful with them, especially Balka and Altar de Muertos are very, very difficult. Uh, so I'm very grateful that we did this wonderful CD and that opened me a uh, lot of doors in, in, in my career. And then I, I wrote a little piece recently that it's called Leo de Cuatro, that I wrote it for them as a present when they, they, they did this wonderful concert, you know, celebrating their 35 right. years of career and Bellas Artes, a very important theater. And uh, so Aaron wrote to me and asked me to write for them a little piece. So I wrote Leo de Cuatro, which is just, it's, it's just a present. It's just a present to say thank you for all the, all, you know, this wonderful career and, and, and this wonderful collaboration that we, that we ever, I mean, that we have together. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's, it strikes me always at how interdependent this relationship is between composers and performers when it, when it works out well in, in this case, the most in, in, and I wondered if you could speak to, um, just to the importance of this in your, in your experience, these relationships, and perhaps in the context of where you hope uh, Latin American music goes uh, um, as performers, as a as a as a female composer in um, in the Latin American uh, yeah. musical constellation, um, this the, where you hope to see see this in the future and this importance of this relationship between composer and performer. I don't know if Saul, you want to start. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Okay, well, I think that, you know, the, the Latin American Quartet has been doing a very important job, which is also um, mentoring other string quartets in Latin America. And, and I'm saying this because this is very important. Now we have more string quartets than, than before. I remember that when I was a student, there were very few string quartets, and one of them was Cuarteto Latinoamericano. But, and right now, all my students, right, uh, they can count with more string quartets. And this is really thank you to the, 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 the Cuarteto Latinoamericano because they have been doing a lot of important uh, job, you know, mentoring string quartets that helping new performers to, to create their own groups, and, and which is very, very important. I think the relationship between a performer and a composer is essential. Essential. I mean, if, 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 for any composer, the only way to grow up and to learn is by hearing their own music. And so this collaboration is just essential. And, and, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, the, 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 the importance of, of, of this work by Cuarteto Latinoamericano, you know, that being the leaders of other string quartets and putting the example that, you no, know, no, and the importance of, of that, which is. I think this is it's amazing. And not only in Mexico, in Costa Rica and in Colombia, they've been collaborating with other string quartets. So I think that we cannot imagine the Latin American music without not thinking about, about the Cuarteto Latinoamericano. It's not only in Mexico. They've been focusing in, in, in all Latin America and, and we have to be very grateful with them because they, they, they did this tremendous amount of work. Indeed. Indeed, thank you so much, Gabriela. Is go ahead, so or I wanted to mention just one person, which is a, uh, Gabriela's teacher, Mario La Vista, a composer who is the bridge between the nationalist generation and the new postmodern generation, where, to which I think Gabriela belongs. Mario La Vista created a language all of his own, uh, very far from any national expression, very pure, very refined. And he has uh, written seven string quartets, of which five 
have been written for us. Harmonic sounds and in ancient sonorities. And he has really developed a new language for string instruments. And this is something that we are very proud of. The, the music that Mario La Vista has written for us is uh, one of the everlasting uh, contributions that I think I want to think the quartet will live after we are not longer around. And and some of you in the audience may remember uh, Delphos uh, Danza Contemporanea, and that company performed at Mini a couple of years ago and is led by uh, Mario's daughter Claudia La Vista. So it's a it's a, a wonderful legacy that 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 family has 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 created. Uh, I'd like to just leave a moment uh, for anyone to, for any closing comments um, or not. We've certainly had a wonderful conversation together. I just wanted to mention that uh, although by now this is our purported mission to carry music, Latin American music around the world, I must say that I am a little bit disappointed that this has not happened the way we envisioned it would. Still today, it's very seldom that you see Latin American concert music programmed. If it weren't because of people like Gustavo Dudamel and Gabriela Ortiz and a very few other composers who carry the torch, this music would not be played around. And there are many hundreds of fantastic composers, live and not alive, whose music should be played along all other great comp composers in humanity, and it's not. We will not give up yet, and I hope I will see this dream come true at some point. And thank you for sharing that. It's so appropriate as we think deeply about how we expand the repertoire that we're presenting at MINI, and certainly um, in, in, in this country and around the world. It's, it's a, a incredible legacy and very rich, rich, uh, rich tradition of, of past and current music. And we certainly are looking forward to exploring uh, Latin American music more deeply at MINI. Um, thank you so much, Sal Bitran, Gabriela Ortiz, Tony Geist for joining me for this creative process conversation. It's what a, what a wonderful opportunity we have with this digital venue to really go deeper. And I know that our audiences will appreciate the concert that much more. And, uh, and I look forward to, to a future conversation and set of performances together. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you indeed, yes.